Um, I'll invite um, participants on the line to um, ask questions, post their questions in the chat box. Um, if we don't have many questions, I do have a couple of polling questions I'll come back to, but I'll, for now, um, we'll move into some question and answer. We did have one question a little bit earlier um, from Carrie. Um, and she, she asked it to Dennis, and he partly answered it, but I wondered if we could revisit. She asked, um, if we can't fundamentally shift that balance of power and influence from our, you know, the position of our nine to five job, um, how, how do you suggest we do that? How do we actually get involved? What are some things that um, we can do in our positions and in our lives? That well, let me go to nine to five because I think people, uh, you know, Sudbury, I mean, it's still a big deal, but Sudbury had a very receptive uh, board of health. But if you look at some of these places that I'm most familiar with Ontario, savvy public health people have been able to get what we would think would be very, very conservative uh, parts of Ontario to buy into this. And uh, what I mean by that is they are able to phrase things in such a way that they don't come off as subversive. This would be public health units all across Ontario. Like I said, I won't name any of them, but some of them you'd expect this to be the, the last area where they would begin talking about uh, promoting health through uh, equitable distribution of resources. The Nine to five thing, of course, also is uh, the professional associations, the labor unions. Uh, the reality is that these organizations, whether it's Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives or uh, Campaign 2000, they're absolutely not starved for resources, but they have the potential. Uh, the Broadband Institute's another place that is putting out tremendous stuff. The problem is nobody knows about it. So what you do is you, you, you act as citizens. But I think the main focus today probably, in addition to all of that, should be to look for examples across Canada of health units that have been able somehow to take a lot of what I said and to put it in language that actually begins to educate people. And the other thing, of course, and it's a tremendous amount of work. I read about the stuff that has been done in Peterborough or been done in Sudbury. It is really exhausting reaching out to members of city council, reaching out to the members of the Board of Health, talking to the opposition politicians, and communicating to them that you don't have to be a socialist to believe in fundamental principles of, of fairness, justice, and equity. And uh, I think that's where we look to the uh, European conservative countries, where they've been able, or, or even flash back to Danny Williams in Newfoundland. These are fundamental issues of, of justice, their economic issues, their human rights issues, and uh, it's, it, just again, we need to look at examples of what's been done in Canada and to try to model them. Shanak, have you got anything, any suggestions on this? Um, no, not more than that. Uh, can mm -hmm. you hear me? Yep, yeah, you're good. Yeah, I, I would agree that, that those are ways to sort of move forward. Don't invite me out to talk to your health unit. Invite Penny Sutcliffe to come talk to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, it's you know it's there has to be um, genuine intentional uh, attention to to you know structuring the function of public health work to address those power and influence um, shifts. I know you know I've been I've been doing a lot of focus on engaging with um, community, so community engagement to address health equity and, you know, providing that that voice to community members and in a meaningful and genuine way and allowing communities to actually um, inform public health decisions and priorities and resource allocation um, is one way to, um, to help shift some of that as well. 
Okay, we, um, we did have a second question from Rebecca. Um, she wanted to know a little bit more about, so you, Shanak, you had mentioned Christine Johnson as a health equity lead. Um, so Christine aside, there are, uh, um, who is wonderful, there are a few organizations across Canada right now who have um, health equity lead positions. And um, I wonder if, um, if you want to describe a little bit what you know about that, and then if others on the line also have that experience, if they can share a bit about their work. I know we've got um, we've got a couple of other health equity leads on the line as well. If you want to share a bit about your your job, Shanak, can you describe it a little bit? What you understand? Yeah. So um, when Christine and I worked together, we were both in content lead positions, and she was, um, but it was regional, and so that role has shifted now to a provincial role at the science and systems performance level, uh, which I think really has added to um, the ability to kind of uh, level up and um, have a sort of united front around this issue in Nova Scotia. Um, so one of the, many of the things that she does involves uh, research, but it also involves kind of pulling evidence and bringing it into practice. Um, using a health equity lens that um, was developed under her um, guidance and um, so really embedding, as someone else talked about, embedding health equity in the work. Um, so that would be her, um, solely her role really is to be sure that in, in all of the work that public health does, where is health equity and how do we really emphasize that and be sure that we're deliberately um, recognizing it and working towards that. Um, so it is that is her full role um, is kind of the uh, consultant role and, and one that um, is there uh, to pull in evidence to be involved in research like um, this rapid review here and um, yeah I would I'd say that's the gist of it although I know that uh, there are others on the line that work with Christine uh, closely I um, I work mostly with her in a research capacity but um, practice-wise, she the role has changed a little bit, and now that it's a provincial. Yeah, and what I know about health health equity lead, you know, quote unquote lead positions um, across the country is it is it, it varies. Um, so you know, in Ontario, public health units there are each health unit has um, two social determinants of health public health nurse positions that um, in some cases are the um, de facto health equity lead as well. Some organizations have additional health equity related staff. Um, and their roles really vary. Um, their roles vary from you know, implementing very frontline um, programs and interventions with a, a social determinants theme to actually developing policy or ensuring that health equity is part of organizational documents. Um, our NCCDH, for anyone who's on the line who is um, a, who is a health equity lead, where health equity is the primary responsibility of your job, we have a health equity clicks um, collaborative group of health equity leads that um, we are hosting on our website. And so certainly if you are not a member of that already, I know there are some members on here now, but um, if you're not a member already and want more information, certainly let me know. Um, you know, I know other, there are other areas of the country where health equity leads um, are, are working with mental health leads and are actually developing, you know, health equity strategies. So it, it's really, I think it's really varied. And, and what I'm understanding is it's largely a reflection of the values of that organization, um, what the actual role would be. Does that sound fair? Anyway, um, so I'm seeing some comments come in, but not um, not a lot of more questions. Um, I do have another polling question, maybe that I'll put up to see if um, see if others have an idea. So we we the collective we of speakers here um, were wondering what suggestions our audience would have here, and we've talked about this a bit, I guess, already. So maybe. Um, 
Diane, one of my students, yeah. one of my students, let's Dennis here. Yeah, one of my students the other day asked questions about policy change and this and that. And one of the models of policy change is that if you don't have the powers that be or the government on your side, you find a champion within the government. Mm. Now, okay. without stretching uh, history or reality too far, uh, certainly in the liberal government in Ottawa. We had uh, Carolyn Bennett, we had Jane Philpott, who we don't have anymore. Uh, who's the, uh, tell me, who's the housing person downtown Toronto that Kathy's friend with? Uh, a guy used to be a, uh, Colin uh, Vaughn, Adam Vaughn. Adam Vaughn was always a firebrand when he was on city council. Well, Toba just said he isn't anymore, but now he's in Ottawa. So the idea is to somehow make connections with people. Now, Margaret Whitehead once told me that during the 20 years that Margaret Thatcher was in power, they, the uh, health equity people worked really, really, really hard with the opposition parties, such that in 1997, the uh, Tony Blair's Labor government a Labor Party ran the election around growing health inequalities. So that's something that certainly one could consider how you do that through your associations, through you as a member of your local political party. Somehow communicate. There's this incredible blind spot. There's no city, there's no province that actually has the issue of health inequalities on the public agenda. That doesn't mean they sometimes don't do stuff that addresses health inequalities. But in contrast to just about every other developed country, nobody wants to talk about health inequalities, which continues to be a wonder to me. So if you're friends with anybody in the Liberal Cabinet in Ottawa, or you can probably want to talk to Rachel Notley, who probably needs some cheering up, uh, <laughs> you somehow we have to communicate to the movers and shakers that this stuff is real, it's important, and it has the potential for traction. But it's not as if I've been such a great success doing that either. So, well, and this concept of champions is interesting. And in and I met Marilee Naujizik, who's the president of the Canadian Indigenous Nursing Association, Dina, um, back in May, and she said to me, "We have to remember." that every champion was once a beginner. Was once a? And once a beginner. And oh, beginner. So, yeah. You know, sometimes I, I think that we in public health um, think we can't be champions because we're either not formal leaders or it's not our main focus. But um, every champion was once a beginner. Every champion had to start somewhere. Um, and the concept of community champions, which someone else also offered here, is a really important one because that's where some of that lived expertise can come as well. Um, so that's, yeah, that's yeah, very important. To show you how difficult it is, I think there's at least three members of the provincial parliament in, uh, in Ontario now that mm. uh, got master's degrees in health promotion. Two, at least two or three have MPHs, and they're all in the NDP, uh, which is the opposition party in Ontario now. And gee, you know, you'd like to think that they would be enough of a core that the NDP would begin to adopt some of these positions. And of course, yeah. if the NDP adopted it, then the liberals would steal it, and we'd have uh, a good happy ending. But it's been so difficult. There's just been no ability to gain a political traction on these yeah. issues. It's a difficult one, right? Um, so there's been some good, some good suggestions here. Um, I'm going to put up one more question, I think, which also gives people a few more minutes to add questions in the chat box. Um, so what about the public? What about the public's understanding um, of why it's important? Um, in our, you know, in our community engagement webinar in September, um, Nancy Stewart, who is on the line, um, somewhere during our, our formative conversation, she said, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, build public support for why this is important and that we're all part of you know, that same community and that by addressing inequities, it actually benefits all of us. It benefits the whole 
community. And, you know, sometimes community priorities is what drives then public health and political priorities. So what are some ways? Education, reducing stigma, targeted social media campaigns. Um, on the topic of stigma, um, some of you, many of you may already know this, but um, the Chief Public Health Officer report is due out very, very soon. And um, the focus of that will be stigma and discrimination and the role of public health. So I'm not sure exactly when, but um, it will be out soon. So that will be hopefully very informative. Any thoughts on what you're what you're seeing here, Shanak or Dennis? Getting into the school system. Frameworks Institute is very good. So there's some really good suggestions, some really good comments here. I wasn't aware that the public health medical officers wrote a piece on poverty somewhere around October 17th. Were either of you guys aware of that? No. 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 Okay. If anyone uh, knows where I can access that, uh, please do post that, post that link. We'll leave the chat box open for a few minutes if you happen to know. No, one of the things that NCCDH could do, I'm stunned at how many times I come across stuff that was tremendous that may have come out from the public health agency, uh, especially the public health agency, and there's no, we know there's no publicity around it. Like the Health mm -hmm. Inequalities Portrait, 2008, uh, 2017, major themes. One of my students showed me there's a portal, Health Inequalities Portal, that by right. just clicking on buttons, you can generate uh, health inequalities profiles between yeah, Indigenous yeah. and other people. There's, ju there's such tremendous stuff that uh, dedicated civil servants are turning out, but we don't know about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I try to publicize it on the SDOH listserv, but uh, gee, there's so much really good stuff that comes out that, yeah. again, we don't know about. I know, and I think by portal you're talking about the um, that health inequalities. Yeah, the health uh, inequalities portal. Back, right? Yeah, yeah and, and they have great. they got everything. They got health inequality stuff on asthma, on child development, on diabetes, and uh, it's yeah. really, really well done. Really yeah. well yeah. done. Yeah, and, it is really. Uh, and you know, we do. I mean, and it's it's interesting because we do share some of that stuff, but. It's, it's really sometimes hard to know how to get everybody. And so, you know, that's a, that's a big role for all of us, really, probably for all practitioners um, to, be, to be promoting and, and as we hear about things, getting, getting stuff out. Oh, and of course, the other thing, all, you know, let me see, there's 141 of you left. Everybody should send a very nice email. Well, the last, last time I did, Andre Picard accused me of just trying to sell my books. But trying to get on Andre Picard's back and whenever he does happen to do something that's kind of edgy and social determinants, uh, mm -hmm. tell him there's so much more that could be done. Yeah, yep. Okay, well, I think we're, um, we're actually at the end, I think, of our uh, questions and of our um, sessions. Is there anything... Um, I'm going to leave the uh, link up here for the evaluation and encourage people to uh, fill that out. Any <coughs> last thoughts from you guys? Shanak, do you uh, got any last thoughts? No, I, th I think it's important to have um, opportunities like this to, to sort of think together and share together. Um, and I liked that the topic is deliberately political um, and that it, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that and uh, the system level and I find um, sometimes when we talk about health equity, we get stuck in, you know, what is the individual practitioner's capacity to do the work or what is the organizational capacity to do the work and we're missing this really crucial conversation about um, the political and economical factors mm -hmm. involved. Um, and really the, the power that the system has in um, doing this kind of work. And so I really appreciate 
the opportunity to have that conversation today and to learn from those of you who are, are doing this work every day um, with many challenges. And um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Uh, and, and like I said earlier, the, the moral distress sometimes that can come with that, knowing we have this evidence and we have this knowledge of, of really this, this stagnant kind of state of dealing with self-equity. And I think it really is useful to have an outlet for folks to, to speak about. So um, yeah, I, I thank you for including me. And I'm, I'm really interested in pulling some of these pieces together and thinking about uh, moving forward. Thanks. Great. Dennis? And I would just uh, like to uh, give another acknowledgement, and that's to Connie Clement, oh, who nice. really has been such an influence in terms of the impact of the Collaborating Center out there. Oh, Dennis, that's really nice. That's really nice. For those of you who um, aren't aware, Connie Clement was our scientific director for a number of years, just recently retired in the spring. Um, Claire Becker is now with us, but Connie really uh, resurrected NCCDH <laughs> um, a few years ago and has really helped shape the organization we are now. And um, that's a really nice acknowledgement, Dennis. Thank you. I'll make sure to tell her that that came out. All right. Well, everyone, thank you very, very much. Um, I really appreciate your comments and your insights. I really appreciate your questions. Um, we will close the webinar line right now. I will send out uh, a summary in the coming weeks. And um, the link will be posted, or the web recording will be posted on our webinar, or our webinar channel. <laughs> it's pretty much our, our YouTube channel. And um, I guess I'll ask our speakers